Good afternoon. Happy Savage Saturday, keepers of the cash. Gary B, the casual comic guy here. We're here with Savage Saturday, episode 159. And today we're going to read the first part of a three-story arc. Uh, well, three-part arc about Cull before he was king uh, of Volusia. So we're going to get into this. It's going to be a lot of fun. You're going to see the origins of King Cull. Back when he was just Cull of Atlantis. Back when he was being hunted. Back when his life wasn't worth anything. All right. And this story starts at least part one. And the Savage Sword of Conan, issue 190. All right. And it is the backup feature in this story. And we're going to get right to it. Now, in this story, we have Roy Thomas as the writer. We have E.R. Cruz as the artist. Uh, John Simic as the letterer. And Mike Rockwitz as the, I mean, as, as the editor. So, got a good team here. And we'll start out, it says, In a pre-cataclysmic age, many centuries before the time of Coney and the Sumerian, a warrior equally fearsome was born upon a small continent which lay between the Pictish Isles and the Thurian mainland, Cull of Atlantis. All right, and this is called Death and Life in Tiger Valley. Now, as our splash page opens, we see a mage um, divining, divining something out of some kind of spell that he's doing, and the king sitting behind him. And the mage is saying, The meaning of the runes is clear, my chieftain, as clear as the crystals that wink and gleam beneath the lake of emeralds. A child born in the caves of our tribe during the next full moon is destined, one day, to rule the Thurian continent. And as we go to our next page, you see the, the king contemplating, and the mage is still speaking. He says, The great god Balka has scrawled his will, scrawled it in the blood among the stars. And what Balka has decreed must ever. And you can see the, the king's face getting madder and madder. Then he finally screams, Enough, shaman! And uh, he says, I said enough. And he smashes all the shaman stuff that he's using the divine. And um, the shaman says, Obadar, the prophecy which made itself known through me is not, aim is not an arrow aimed at your heart. And the king says, How could it not be, Ramos, when I, chief of the Sea Mountain tribe, am childless? Do you truly imagine that any of our race will ever conquer the seven kingdoms of the mainland as you predict? So... We're getting the story set up. The king is uh, very distraught because he is without child. He is without heir to the throne. And he does not want to see the throne go to someone else. So, and just some great black and white art here. As we turn to the page, our story continues. And the king is still speaking. says, unless the first has conquered all. So, he's continuing what he said from the last page. Do you truly imagine that any of our race will ever conquer the seven kingdoms in the mainland, as you predict, unless the first has conquered all Atlantis? And uh, the shaman says, even if that is so, my chieftain, you may well be dead in your tomb long before such a child ever grows to manhood. Or, I mean, and the king calls out, guards, guards. And the shaman says, please, I, I did not mean to. And uh, as they come in, they go, you called, Badar? And he goes, there's death I want, Gormley, as he speaks to one of his guards. And um, one of the guards says, Ramos there. And he goes, you could have had him slain any time in the past 10 years. And the king says, no, not Ramos. The shaman has merely pointed the way to the one who must die. The moon will be full five nights from now. Every child born during that full moon, whether male or female, deformed or whole, you are to slaughter on the night of its birth. So the king's starting to go a little mad here. And uh, as the page continues, he's speaking to the guards. He goes, well, what are you loafing about for? I've given you your orders. Out of my sight. All of you. And then you kind of see the guards talking to each other. He says, he grows madder all the time, Rogar. He goes, hey, but Gormley, what of your wife? And they're whispering to each other. Isn't your wife due to be delivery? delivered? And he goes, not for another fortnight, thank Valka. And as Gormley and... Um, Rogar um, dissipate and leave. Uh, you see them walking away and just kind of watching behind them as Gormley makes his way home. And we see him coming in upon his wife and his wife says, Husband, what's wrong? Is your fearful look because our child may come at any moment? 
And he says, just shut your mouth, woman. And she goes, what, what is it? Have I angered you? He goes, no, oh no, not you, Osa. Never you. And you see um, another panel where the mages, uh, the shaman's kind of following. So we're getting some, some mystery here. We got one of the guards whose wife is due on this night of the moon where all children are ordered to be slaughtered. And now he's got to think about how to save his, ch his child. So as we turn to the next page, we just get a shot of a tiger on a little hill and it's, uh, it's mewling. And then it said, the striped people roar their savage worship to the full moon. But I'll curse the woman in the moon till my dying hour for delivering you this damnable night. And this is uh, Gormley speaking to his wife as she's in labor. She goes, there, it's finished, dear wife. Our twins are born, a boy and a girl, both alive and healthy. She's like, twins? An ill omen in Atlantis. And he goes, because her voice is very weak. And he says, no, their silence, rather, is a portent of double good. Though Badar will never see it so. And she still weeps. She says, please, my love, do not let my babies be killed. Let that be your final gift to me. And his wife passes from complications of the childbirth. He's like, Osa? And he sees that she's passed with tears in his eyes. He's holding his twins and he's making his way away from him. He goes, do not worry, little ones. You will never be sacrificed on the altar of our chieftain's frenzied fear. And then off to, off Paley you hear Gormley. And, uh, and it's his friend. And he says, it is, is it time yet to? And he goes, by Valka, your wife. And Gormley says, dead. But that, but she would prefer that to seeing Badar's decree carried out. And the kids start crying a little bit. He's like, hush, children. My thanks for coming, Dalfa. But you vowed to come alone. And he goes, Rogar, guess your secret, old friend. And the other guy, Dalfa, says, I insisted on coming. But Dalfa has sworn me to silence. All right. And then it says, then let us be gone. Before these two remember that infants are supposed to cry a lot more when they are born. And un unknowns to them, unbeknownst to them, you know, the shaman's watching them the whole time. He's off in the background. And then they come across him and they go, Hail Ramos. Uh, this is two other guards coming. He goes, Hail warriors. Outdoing our chieftain's bidding this night of nights, are you? And they go, It's not a task we relish, priest. Still, we heard a child whimper moments ago. We thought perhaps Gormley's wife had. And, uh, um, Ramos lies right there to these two guards that are approaching. He goes, disturb their sleep if you must. He goes, yet it was a night bird you heard. And he covers for them as they make their escape. And they don't know that that Ramos is doing this, that he's covering their trail so they can get away with the children. So uh, the King Shaman is proven to be quite a good guy, quite a stand-up character. So as he as he's talking to these other two guards, they hear another cry out. A bird? Are you sure? One of the guards says. He goes, "Listen, now that was an infant's wail, and no mistake." And um, uh, one of the guards says, "Penlaw's wife was due as well. Come." And um, Ramos, the shaman, says, "Hey, do what you have to, spearman, and may no babes cry. Then really disturb your well earned sleep." You know, and then he whispers to himself as he departs. As for me, I'm off for Tiger Valley. It is a dangerous place, this direction in which Gormley and his friends carried their precious burden. But could even a vale where the striped people, and that's what they call the tigers, will be deadlier for man for them than the village of the Sea Mountain tribe? And as we cut to the next page, we see Gormley with both his kids in his hand. And he says, be still just a little longer, tiny ones. Ah, that thornbush yonder was what I was seeking. Forgive me, but I must leave you here till I can bury your mother. Then I shall return and take you to. And then there's a tiger's face right there growling. And uh, he says, a king tiger, so close? No, I, I cannot leave you here, my babes. I shall tell my companions. I must go on without them until we reach the far coast. And then as he turns, the companions are fighting. Rogar, what have you done? And he sees that Rogar has betrayed him and killed the other guy. He says, merely use force where I had hoped to employ stealth. And now he knows he is a man betrayed by, um, oh my gosh, I just forgot his name, by Rogar. 
so things are starting to get a bit dire. <coughs> and after being found out he was betrayed, he goes, that roar so, uh, showed me I cannot risk some wild beast carrying off your brats before I could return for them. So I will take them back at once and gain Badar's favor. So this guy betrayed them just to gain the king's favor. And, you know, Gormley says, you always meant to betray me? Then one of us must join Dalfa in his death march. And um, Rogar draws a bow and shoots an arrow into Gormley. He says, one of us surely must. But, you know, Gormley says, I was wrong, Rogar. And then not one of us, but, but both. And he throws a, his sword into the chest of of the traitor. And they both fall down dead on the scene. And then you see the shaman hopping across the scene, and he just whispers, Valka. And as he kneels down at Gormley's um, dead form, he says, You reckon without the greed and treachery of your fellow Atlanteans, did you not, Gormley, give the man some honor? He goes, Now you are a feast for worms and vultures, and your newborn over there. And he can hear them crying. He's like, Ow, your father planned well, little ones, leaving you in a bower wreathed with such, ow, sharp thorns. He goes, so one of you is the babe foretold out by the runes. The bundle of pink flesh whom Badar feels will one day hurl him from the chieftain's chair. Curse me for being a priest, not a warrior, that I had the strength enough to carry only one of you at a time. Are you both boys, girls? No time to check. But I will I will return for your twin as soon as I... It continues on the next page. And uh, we'll get to that in a second. So you see him carrying off one of them. He can't carry the burden of both he's trying to get one to safety and come back for the other after the battle that had just killed their father and the traitor and the father's friend as well so there is a lot lot going on uh these two infants have lost both parents in one night so really tragic for them now one of them is being carried away by the priest the other one left hopefully to survive until the priest uh the shaman can come back but on the next page, we see that there's Tigris coming forward. And he says, Tigris, stalking this way. Valka, forgive me, must flee. And he's like, ow, damnable thorns. I, I fear I've left the Tigris a wide road to your twin, little one. But at least I pray to the gods that I have saved whichever of you is destined to rule the seven kingdoms. And and as he makes his way, they make uh, Tigris make their way towards the infant left behind. And the infant's crying. And you see a tiger come up and it's got its face and the infant's face and it's growling. And the infant just lifts a hand up and puts it on the tiger's snout. And he, said, and he just, you know, makes a little baby gibberish. And the tiger just takes the bundle up in its mouth and carries off the baby as the baby, um, as the baby is wooing. And you hear a call. And then on that epic known... On that epoch, known by the Nemean Chronicles as the pre-cataclysmic age, there are more legends than accurate history. And this says Robert E. Howard. So as part one ends off, we got our young cull being hauled away by the tigers. So they didn't eat him. There's some kind of destiny there to be foretold. He has some kind of connection with these tigers. As they held on the night of his birth, they muled. So what that's going to be, well, we know where it ends up, but we'll continue these humble beginnings next week for Call of Atlantis. Right now, just call the baby. But what do you guys think of this first part, part one of the origin of Call? Seeing him, what happened before he was born, the tragic events of his birth, both his parents dying on the night he was born, and then to be carried away by tigers. And don't forget, this is called Atlantis. His totem is the tiger, and it's the tiger for a reason. So we got some goodness ahead of us. But I think a fun story, well written by Roy Thomas, uh, good art by E.R. Cruz, and it's just fun to see the beginning of this great hero created by Robert E. Howard. It's good to see what's going on, to see how this baby survived, and against all odds, and it's going to grow up to rule the Thurian age. But that's it for this week, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you guys had a fun time with the story. And until next time, keep it casual.